NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all of your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise online scanning service. For more information, visit their website at netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring. Everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash tenable jobs. Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly. This is the stories. For this week, I'm here with Michael Santarcangelo, and we're ready to get things started. I'm going to start from the, like the bottom of my stories and work our way up, I think. That's kind of how I wrote them up. I worked my way backwards. But the first story I have is five common firewall, misconfig- five common firewall configuration mistakes. That's right. This article was published recently, not in <laughs> 2001. Um, <laughs> So I don't get his number three and number four. If you go read the article as it relates to firewalls, maybe I just didn't read it closely enough. Um, However, it boils down to uh, those firewall recommendations from 1999. Uh, Actually implement some rules, uh, harden your firewalls, and collect and analyze the logs. I think that the real question this article brought up was how do we now apply firewalls in today's world of cloud and software as a service is my question to you. Michael Santarcangelo. I think it's a great question. I mean, you know, it, it, let, let's go back for a second too, because what I what I think is interesting when I'm looking at the list, and you're right, three and four are good points. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure they're connected to firewalls right. specifically, okay. but uh, when we when we're talking about the rogue services and the policy configurations and everything else, you know, we we tried this in the '90s. We a uh, firewall is good. And they go, what do you mean good? And you go, well, the internet, bad. Firewall, good. If, you, <laughs> if you're on the internet, it's bad. Bad things can happen on the internet. But if you've got a firewall, you're good. And what we never said was, oh, by the way, um, did, did we forget to mention you need to write rules that actually work. And you need to check your configurations and you need to test it. So if you have a firewall but you have an any, any rule, um, that's, that's not good. And that's not even and, the worst of it, right? You have to, a firewall is another thing on your network that you have to apply security to. Yeah. So um, what I think is kind of interesting, I mean, it starts out with a a research stat from Gartner, 95% of all firewall breaches are caused by misconfiguration, not flaws. Yeah, I mean, I think think it's a fair point. What's interesting is, right, there was the Jericho project years ago, and they said uh, data, there's a new perimeter, the perimeter is data, um, you know, forget all your firewalls. When we're looking at this migration to the cloud, and you talked about this in the interview segment, right? It's, it doesn't matter whether you're going to a platform, you're going to infrastructure, you're going to secu- you know a software as a service or some sort of a service. W- what I like about the cloud is it's a forcing function. It's changing the way that we're thinking about stuff. But but when we say that, and we go, oh yeah, forcing function that's bad. No no, I think it's good. It's forcing us to look at stuff functionally, and it's allowing us a mechanism by which we can get the security which we hadn't had before. So I guess the question is, do we need firewalls? Or do we need a function like a firewall? And in a, a highly distributed, overly matrixed, I mean, gosh, when we did the firewalls in the 90s, I mean, we still had batch windows. We could take a network down. We had, I mean, the lines coming in were expensive, so you only had one. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, we barely had cell phones. So to think that you could connect your cell phone to a modem, I mean, okay, Mr. Showoff, <laughs> that's nice, right? So, but if you look at it now, I mean, how, how many, how many, 
different pathways do we have, not just into our, our systems, but to the data? To How the many data. places are proliferating? So, I mean, I, I, if we look at it, this idea of a castle and a moat and a firewall is that break stop. Is it? I mean, it. I, I'm not saying we throw them out, but do, do we do we need them anymore? Is, is that where our focus should be? So let me throw the question is, back to you. Is firewalling, and I'm going to ask another question of you, is firewalling... <laughs> As it relates to the cloud, just going to become a compliance and regulatory activity in the future? Like, are we just going to go say, well, yeah, this application's hosted here, and I've got my checklist that when an application's hosted there, we have to make sure that we do these things that are offered by the provider in terms of security, and it just becomes like the checkbox security? Is that, is that going to be part? I think that's going to be part of it to answer my own question, but... I think yes and no. Um, I, I'm not sure it becomes checkbox mentality, but yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that's really kind of got me excited about cloud is that if you talk to somebody who's a cloud provider, they say, hey, we do one thing. So like you and I have talked before about patching and the amount of time to patching, and I realize that's not necessarily firewalls, but we've talked about it. Well, if you're in a standard enterprise, your server has to do so many different things. When you're trying to patch it, you've got to pay attention to 20, 30, 40, 50 or more different things that that server is supposed to do. A lot of these purpose-built cloud providers, it does one thing, and they know exactly what that one thing is. So for them to be able to patch it, that, mm. that's a very simple process for them. And if it isn't, then they probably need to reconsider their model to a certain extent. So let's back that off then to being able to do the firewalls. W one of the things that comes out of this forcing function is that these providers are now starting to realize, you know what, we have to share information, not just with our customers. We've got to share information with each other. And we have to plug into these different systems. So I don't think it's as much as a check, yep, they said they've got a firewall. I think it's actually, yep, they've got a firewall and we're able to pull data from that and that works with our threat intelligence. It works with our SIM system. It works with our whatever else. So even though our data and our access is controlled by somebody else, we're good. We have those checks and balances on it. And because they know what should or shouldn't be expected into their environment, they're able to lock down and block out a lot of that stuff. So, but I think, I think Mike, for, for but, most of the world uh, in corporate enterprises, businesses, most of us are they're not getting rid of their internal infrastructure anytime soon. I think I agree. that day's coming, who knows how far in the mm -hmm. future. But the interesting thing is, if you're a startup, and Mike, you talk to a lot of startups, um, do you have any physical systems other than your laptops, right? Yeah. You don't. Everything is in the cloud, right? Everything is an application that's provided for me. Yeah. You know, how, not how do you secure that? I mean, I know there's, and I need to do some more research into these vendors, to be honest with everyone, um, but I know there's vendors out there that will help you manage that, and I think that's really one of the futures of, of security, certainly, is being able to manage your data Essentially, is what it boils down to, like Mike said, in the cloud. Yeah, I mean, Captain Obvious has arrived. No, but, 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 but if we hijack this a different way, I mean, you talk about that. I think it's a good point, right? So, so we have a lot of startups that are using stuff in the cloud that may or may not ask firewall questions. That may or may not need to ask firewall questions, right? Here's the underlying point behind this: there's firewalls, and then there's the functionality of a firewall, right? Which is to provide a spot where you can look at traffic, not just what's coming in, but also what's going out. We're not so good about that, right? The way that we right. set up a lot of our stateful inspection is, oh, if it's outbound, it's probably okay. And a lot of attackers know that, and they take advantage of that. And, and that's, there's usability. I mean, I, I get all the nuances behind firewalls, but when we talk about startups, then I saw a couple of articles this week that, that were, you know, startups have to take security seriously. And I read the article. Here's the whole, too long, didn't read. They got to take it seriously. Right. Okay. But what does that mean? So what's interesting is if we say something like this and, and we say this to uh, startups, so what do they what do they need to think about? What what questions should they be asking? And I think that's where we as an industry need to go. I, I think we've talked about it before. I, it's this this concept to me of minimum viable security. It's not a checklist. I mean, I've looked at it before. I played with it with other people. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's something I think that that we need to spend some more time on. You and I've talked about it from a firmware perspective. If I, if I'm talking to a startup uh, that's using chips. What are the three to five questions I should ask them? So I think, I think from a mindset perspective, and this is where I'd love to get feedback on this, is if, if you've got a startup that's really excited about what they're doing, they're not sure it's going to work, right? They're doing what they call the minimum viable product. I think the match to that 
is a mindset of minimum viable security. So we need to guide people with three or four questions that they should be able to ask. And then the providers that they're going to should be able to answer right. those three or four questions. Well, the other thing too, Mike, and we're only, at, we got 19 more stories to talk about. But <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Um, but you bring up a really good point that's something that we I don't think we've really discussed on the show before is I think that as we move towards cloud and, and cloud provided applications or SaaS applications, that Security still is a function, but the landscape and environment is different. But a lot of the processes that we still have, I think fundamentally, maybe in a slightly higher level, right, are the same. So we're not creating rules on the firewall and doing stateful packet inspection. We're using Gmail. And right. what does that mean? Well, Google has provided a lot of security mechanisms for Gmail. In other words, if someone logs in from an IP address that they don't normally log into and it sends you an email, how do you respond to that? When someone adds a new account, was that really someone who was authorized to add a new account? The security functions that we know and love are still are still there. Someone needs to respond to that. Just this week, Chris did exactly that. I added a new user to one of our systems and he immediately sent me this message and was like, what was that? Who did that? Who added a new, you know, that's the security process. Right. And when if we have everything in the cloud, those processes still need to exist because what we're right. doing is, is the same, whether we host the infrastructure ourselves or host it somewhere else. And here's the key, and you and I talk a lot about communication. We need to keep translating them functionally. We, ha we have a, this trap we fall into. I've been doing this for 20 years, and you, when you provision a new account, blah, blah, whoa, 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 provision, what, what does that mean exactly? Mm -hmm. And the way you just described it, I created a new account, I was instantly alerted. Yeah, good, great. Well, that's a good question then. Do you want to know if somebody's accessed your account? Do you want to know if there's a new account on your system? Do you? I mean, you know, I like five questions. Maybe there has to be ten. Maybe there has to be something else. It's it's all good. But I, but ex, but what you're doing instinctively is you're making it functional, and that's right. exactly what we have to do. The, the same controls. Look, we're going to have stuff on premise still, especially the enterprises. Oh, yeah. Oh. And and for sure. when we're dealing with enterprise stuff, see, this is the other advantage of the forcing function. Because something gets better in the cloud and they learn how to do it better and more functionally, that will trickle down. I get mm -hmm. leave the politics out of that. But that'll that'll show up in our premise equipment. So that's great. But I think the opportunity that we have then is how do we start to talk about this functionally in terms of outcomes? Not just using our technical jargon and the controls that we're comfortable with, because they may not translate. But functionally, there's a potential challenge and there's an outcome. So what is it that we're trying to do? Right. Like for example, do you want your computer chip to blow up? <laughs> That's a great segue, Mike. I was, looking, I was looking for it, but you nailed it, man. Um, so this is a new self-destructive yeah. computer chip. When the proper circuit is toggled, the article says, a small resistor within the substrate heats up until it shatters um, and will continue shattering even after the initial break, rendering the chip unusable. My question is about controls. How do you control the function that triggers this chip yep. to self-destruct. Is it a physical thing? Do I have to go flip a switch like we see in the movies where I think it was Gene Hackman and what was the movie with Will Smith, right? Goes and throws all the switches yeah. and then they run and his, you know, all his equipment burns. That, what is it called? Enemy of the Enemy State. Enemy of the yeah. State, thank you. And all this stuff blows up. So it's going to be a thing where I'm like, holy crap, we're going to be raided. I better get rid of all the evidence and I go flip a switch and my chip self-destruct. Or is it software enabled? And if it is, how do we put controls so that physically attackers can't just go around in demolishing networks, literally? That's my Look, question. I, I think it's the right question. What, what I think is kind of fascinating, though, is, I mean, didn't we see this type of stuff in Mission Impossible? Like, yeah, so this is, like this the original Mission Hollywood. Impossible yeah. many years ago. This is total Hollywood stuff, dude, for sure. Uh, which is now a reality. Well, so this is interesting. I, I, I think your question is entirely the right question. All I can see when I drill deeper into it is that shattering the glass, which is Gorilla Glass, right, which is what we're using in our cell phones and smartphones and tablets and stuff now. So that stuff's supposed to be indestructible, but let's, let's pretend. Yeah, give one of these chips to my toddler. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Broken. Thanks for playing. <laughs> but, but here's what it says, though. All it says is when the proper circuit is toggled, a small resistor heats up. Mm -hmm. So the operative phrase is exactly what you cued in on. When the proper circuit is toggled. 
Yeah, I don't know if that's it, a it physical doesn't or logical. Say it at all. Yeah. Oh no, it's worse. No, it does say it. My bad. I went down further. The diode can be triggered by radio or by a simple mechanical switch. Oh, that's great. Radio. Oh, radio. It's oh, we're wireless. Fine. Yeah. My bad. We're, we're great. Wireless is so secure. <laughs> we solve those problems. What are we thinking about? We're, we're, we're totally good on that. Oh, uh, sort of, sort of wireless. Wireless way to share that's files uh, in iOS is AirDrop, which has some vulnerabilities. And do you know what the underlying vulnerability was here, Mike? Of course you do, because you're reading the show notes along with me. <laughs> directory. <laughs> it's a directory traversal <laughs> attack, which is a completely new attack that no one's right. ever heard of before. <laughs> I don't even think you've ever talked about it. What in the world are we going to do about a directory traversal attack? Um, it really reminds me of when I was in college, which now is crap. It's a long time ago now. And I had to take the class on... Yeah, it's, thanks, Chris. Chris says it was last year. Um, so uh, I had to take the class many moons ago on Microsoft Office. It was like uh, off computer office productivity or something like that. It was all the office applications except for Access, which was a separate... So, so this is after WordPerfect 5.1. So yeah, you're not so as this old was, as you think you are. Yeah, this was off actual Microsoft Office running on Windows, uh, probably 95 at the time. Um, and But my teacher was a nerd, right? And he was probably just as disgruntled teaching this class as most of us computer nerds were taking it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it, he was like, you know, if you go to certain websites and you just kind of mess with the URL, like you can do cool stuff. And one of the things, uh, I don't think he displayed it for the class, but what he was kind of hinting towards were directory traversal attacks. Now, as I said, I went to college a pretty long time ago. Um, so, and that was one of the things that actually started to spark my interest in, in getting into security was, was stuff just like that. Um, and this was in the, well, it was late 90s anyway when this was taking place. And this was a directory traversal attack. And here we are today... Um, We'll we'll say 15 years later to make myself feel good. 15 years later, uh, still talking about directory traversal attacks. So, well, I, so I, I think there's two things that are interesting. One of the headlines that I saw about this this week said uh, we're going to see a faster adoption to iOS 9 simply because of this. And I went, well, I'm not buying that. I mean, I think Apple does a pretty good job at, at corralling people to upgrade anyway. But you know, what's interesting I is upgr- I upgraded today. I, I did yesterday. I see, okay. It was funny, too. I was like, I'm totally not going to upgrade right away. This time I'm going to, yeah, screw it. I'll upgrade. Yeah. I, <laughs> I bit the bullet and upgraded today. Yeah. I, I also have a backup phone, though. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, 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 figured I'd, some, I figured I'd be okay. That's on Android. So, I think it's important to keep both now. Here's the thing, then, because this, these are questions I like to ask, right? I, I've asked you before about, like, firmware stuff and, and why these things keep proliferating. So... Why is directory traversal still a problem? Is it hard to tamp down? Is it hard to lock it down? Is this an oversight thing? Like, if you're trying to be something that, right, because the idea of AirDrop, which is fascinating because I've never used it, but you're supposed to be able to share files with somebody who's in proximity and do all sorts of stuff. Yeah, okay, whatever. But, so, <coughs> in in the essence of creating something that allows you to share a lot of information between another device, do you pretty much open yourself up to this or is there a way yeah. to do it that you don't two things uh so uh, a technology that makes things easy for end users to share things inevitably has some kind of flaw that leads to a really bad security thing um secondly i i think that the people who are designing this are really put under pressure especially at apple to make yeah. things work Get it out and so they're not of the mindset of how would someone break this? They're of the mindset of, holy shit, I have a deadline. I have to make it work. They're not intentionally writing bad code. They're not intentionally writing insecure code. They're, and I think that's the perception a lot of people have about developers. I think my, my thoughts and feelings on that and beliefs have changed over time. I think that they, they truly want to write good code. They want to make code that works. And they want resilient code. But they're not thinking about how would someone manipulate this and well, do something also evil not, with it. And then that's where we get directory traversal style attacks. Well, yeah, and they're not compensated on, on the security of their code. No. But, but here's, a, here's a flip side to this, too. And this off the cuff, so I may be completely uh, m- mischaracterizing this. But the, but the group that found this, this just came out, right? So this is new. So we're just learning about this now? Or is this something they've been sitting on for months? 
Um, it's in. Uh, I you know that's a good question. I'm not sure. IOS I'm not sure you'll I ever mean, know. The betas came out a while ago, right? But iOS eight has been dropped now officially for about a year mm-hmm. in circulation, and nine right. just came out in the last 24 hours or so. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it, if it took them a year to figure something out, and now they're saying, hey, by the way, we we covered this in nine. Well, okay. So yeah, will we have people that are vulnerable? Yeah, I'd love to see the percentage of people that use AirDrop because I if it's higher than than what I'm thinking, I'd, yeah. I'd love to understand why, because I'm not using it. But I'm, tell you, I, I'm not a good use case. A lot of people are using Windows, though. <laughs> and um, the Patch Tuesday had MS15100. We broke 100. I love these naming <laughs> I think it's, it, well, it means there's 100 security bulletins. That doesn't necessarily equate to 100 security vulnerabilities, because there are multiple CVEs typically in a security bulletin. So that means there's 100 Microsoft bulletins released so far this year, and the year's not over yet. So we could have a record breaker. <laughs> uh, my prediction is a record breaker this year for uh, Microsoft bulletins. Uh, this is a pretty good walkthrough about how you get someone to click a basically a Windows shortcut, which executes code on Windows Media Center. This is good on Windows Vista 7 and 8, including 64-bit versions. Notice Windows 10 is not in that list, as we've talked about increased security on Windows 10. Um, but, uh, you know, I think Microsoft's up to its old tricks on this one. It ranks this as important, <coughs> excuse me, and not critical. It also says... It could allow remote code execution where there's clearly tutorials posted on how to exploit it, which means it does allow remote code execution. And I'm thinking that a lot of this not ranking is important as well. Someone has to click something. And I think what Microsoft doesn't understand is that you know remote exploits probably go back to 2013, reliable ones for Windows, and that attackers know that. And they, they don't do, like the days of a Windows system, a modern Windows system that's not Windows 2000 sitting on the network having a port open and me sending an exploit to it and getting a remote shell, those days are over. I mean, sure, there's still a lot of legacy stuff out there, but the majority, if you do the analysis, which I've done, the majority of all of these attacks that are releasing these Microsoft bulletins require the user to do something, which is why everyone does phishing attacks. Uh, that's just right. what it comes down to. So because you look at this more, right, you, you know, and I haven't really had the chance to ask in a while. All right, I'm enterprise. I'm the enterprise security guy. I'm the security leader. Is this something that I, I need to go brief people on because I'm, I'm legitimately concerned about it happening? I mean, when we look at the attacks and, and we look at people doing lateral movement, all sorts of stuff, is this something then that, that if I'm an attacker and I'm inside of a network – Right. And then I, I saw something, I saw at least I saw the headline this week that was intimating that attackers are using less malware and they're going back old fashioned, getting in there and doing it themselves. Okay, great. So is this, if you're an attacker, you like score, this is going to really make my job easier. Or once you're in, there's so many other easier paths to go once you're inside that, yeah, this is, it's possible, it's proven, and it's not something. That's likely to be used. Well, a couple of different things. So it, the criticality depends on your organization. And one fair. of the first questions when Very you get fair. something like this is, well, how many computers in my organization run Windows Media Center? If it's a lot, yeah, probably something I'm going to go brief someone on because there's a lot of exposure there. If I know that the desktop guys and the people who manage all the workstations have purposely not installed Windows Media Center and all of our workstations, eh, not a big deal. You know, okay. if there are a few, eh, go patch them when you, you know, in a regular cycle or whatever cycle you want, not a big deal. And that's where the criticality rating from Microsoft, the CVSS score, any other severity rating, it doesn't take into account. It's like, well, your criticality rating is definitely based upon how rampant is this in my environment. You don't know. Now, also, you want to take into account, well, how... Well, educated are my users are on phishing attacks. Have we done phishing exercises? How? What other technologies do I have to prevent such phishing attacks from getting into my organization? Those factors, I think, play in uh, as well. So there was another part there, but uh, we got a lot of other stories to talk no, about. It's, it's, probably, it's if good. I forgot about it, it probably wasn't that interesting anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. I think we're good. Um, okay, a lot of security holes. We said that we're patching iOS 9. And we both upgraded, so we're good. We're good. Yeah, everyone else, you're screwed if you haven't gone to iOS 9, apparently. Um, <laughs> scary. Scary speaking of firmware, Mike. Uh, you were mentioning it earlier. Cisco routers 
Did you read about this attack? I didn't get deep into it. I, I only saw that it came across, and then I saw a lot of people talking about it, and yeah. I just... So researchers have uncovered um, that firmware in Cisco devices is being replaced with evil firmware. This is a big deal. Uh, this is not home routers. This, these are actually I, Cisco... Well, they, they used to call it iOS. They still do have a lot of iOS, but there's newer versions of the operating system. Um, I th- believe this one is Cisco iOS, not to be confused with Apple iOS, right? Um, yeah, this is um, this is bad. I mean, this is, you know, re- uh, the attacks that I've talked about for a, a while is if you can replace the firmware, you control the matrix, to use an old movie reference, right? Um, but you control <laughs> the entire environment and can hide and pretty well. And this is done remotely. Uh, this is done remotely, yes. And the scary part is it's attacks on pretty major routers, and no one knows the exact uh, extent of this damage or which routers uh, or whose routers were replaced. Um, but this is this is bad. This is not just bad from a theoretical sense of, wow, there's a bug that someone can replace firmware. This is, it sounds like to me, they discovered this bug because they're like, holy shit, someone swapped out the firmware on this router. <laughs> so if I was thinking about briefing... Uh, I might say, hey, boss, did you upgrade your iPhone? Hey, we got this Windows thing. Hey, but let me sit you down for this one. Yeah. This, this is, one feels more like uh, we probably, in fact, yeah, especially what I'm, if, I, Mike, I if followed, you're a larger enterprise, you yeah. probably have some of the routers that um, might be vulnerable to this attack. If you're a smaller place, you probably don't have a lot of routers that are vulnerable. It sounds to me like they're bigger routers that have this particular issue. Now, you may have some of those routers as well. They're probably well sealed off. This is more like if you're an ISP or you got some of your own infrastructure out on the Internet, this is one you got to pay attention. You're sitting down at the board to figure out how to deal with this. Yeah, but what's interesting, uh, and this is, so I, I, I clicked on a link to click on a link. It was, there's two parts I think are interesting. First one says, so far, 79 devices, 19 countries identified including devices in the USA, Canada, UK, Germany, China, and uh, India, Mexico, Philippines, Ukraine, and it was discovered in the Ukraine. But then, but then it has this next line. It's not clear at this time who's behind a malicious program, but it's believed to be state-sponsored. Is that just our go-to now, though? Like, did somebody roll the attribution dice and go, well, this is totally got to be state-sponsored? <coughs> yeah. Um, I mean, does that help us to say that? I think it was, uh, fi- it was FireEye. That, uh, oh, so it's China that did this then? Yeah, FireEye. Well, FireEye's CEO. Right, FireEye always where's the, China? There was a quote in one of the articles that I read. I think it was the Ars Technica one. Yeah, um, I'm going. The CEO of FireEye is quoted as saying, "Well, in order to pull this off, it has to be state sponsored." And it, I, I think that quote was pulled out of context, so I don't know the exact content. So I'm not burning the FireEye CEO for saying it because it was clear to me when I read it that the quote was pulled out of context. And then the Reuters article that they referenced that had that quote was a broken link. Um, and then I had to move on to other things. So, um, but it's certainly uh, it's not a, a high, I, it, the person that wrote it. It probably has a pretty high degree of skill. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's state-sponsored, though. Um, but to pull off firmware replacement remotely on this particular platform, yeah, it's a high degree of skill. Likely state-sponsored because, you know, to get your hands on some of the stuff to actually do the testing does require some funding. Um, that's not to say that, you know, someone on the underground didn't These are didn't These are it. big Cisco devices that you could buy or that you could pilfer that you could buy on probably freaking eBay these days. So Probably. All right, probably so let, let's expensive. go one, one more thing then. So if I'm going to do an intelligence briefing on this, I'm going to stay away whether it was state-sponsored or not because, frankly, at this point, that has little bearing on what I need to do. Yeah. But if I've got one of these devices that may or may not be affected, I probably need to pay attention to it. Now, what's the likelihood then that somebody from the FBI – or Secret Service already come knocked on my door to talk to me about it. And it, how do I check for it? Is it I, I'm looking for that anywhere. Did somebody release a check for it? Is it a manual check? Did Cisco come out and say, here's something we got for you? I'm not sure. I didn't read anything about that, Mike. I, I have neither. I'm not seeing it, which I think is kind of interesting. Optimistic Paul says that Cisco contacted the affected customers. Um, and I'm not sure how like many Optimistic customers. Paul. That's, that's kind of like it's, Happy Jack. Yeah, you it's think, Optimistic oh, yeah. Paul. Um, Known the track record of large companies, that might not have happened. So you might not know how, if you're vulnerable or not, um, which makes patching it a, a difficult decision. Because, you know, forklift upgrading a firmware on a router that provide I mean, especially if it's a large router from an ISP or something. Um, I've been there. I worked for an ISP. It's not fun. 
It's not fun. Even when you have redundancy, it's still it's still not fun. So, all right, one more one more piece on this because I think it, I think it parlays in the things that we need to think about as an industry. So it says that it appears to be taking advantage of routers. I'm quoting this that use passwords that are factory default or somehow otherwise known. So that's interesting. And then I said, the researcher said it wouldn't be surprising if networking gear from other manufacturers are being affected with a similar backdoor. Mm, it feels a little bit like a reach. Same time, yeah, I, I kind of get it. So, mm-hmm. so, but here's the thing I take away from both of them. Uh, probably an interesting time to make sure that you're not using default passwords, that you have some sort of a password management scheme in mm-hmm. place, especially for your high profile and your important devices. And I guess the, the simple question is to say, if this were to happen in your network, would you know? Have you thought about it? Do you do you check firmware levels? Is that is that a, a, a standard check that you do? If any of the tools that you have, are you doing that? Are you doing regular reports on that? Right, because it's not about this. I mean, yeah, this specific attack is probably something I'd be interested in. But I think broader from an industry perspective, you look at it and you go, oh, "That's kind of interesting." Okay. Yeah, I think are it's, we checking it, for that in smaller companies? It's easier to check for in larger companies yeah. that I've worked for that you've got thousands of routers. Yeah, okay, a router just reported I had a firmware upgrade. Yeah, I mean, you're going to assume that whatever local team there is taking care of that probably upgraded the firmware, you know? it's 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 Or it may not send you a message. Or uh, a lot of times the Cisco programs to monitor all that are pretty horrible. What was the name of that Cisco software that monitored? There's people shouting in their cars right now <laughs> about what it is. It was Windows-based. It was really crappy, and it, like, aggregated logs and information to let you manage Cisco routers. Thankfully, I've forgotten it. What is it? ASDM? It's probably what it's called now. It went through a lot of different name changes. Um, yeah, it was, it was really bad. I don't think it was All ASDM. Right. But anyway. So we way, call that scary. Way off topic now. Well, we call that scary. So we'll come back to scary. Uh, how would you feel uh, getting arrested at school? Oh, maybe you did get arrested at school. I should be more careful with this. 14 years old. What are you trying old. to say? Is that because I'm I, Italian-Armenian? Like, I'm, I'm, you're, I'm, you're hey, profiling I'm Italian, me? I'm, I'm Italian. I'm, but I'm, I'm Armenian. A, that's, like, that's close true. to, like, Turkey, which is close to, that's true. like, Iran or however the geography right. works so out I, there. So I'm that not, must I'm mean I'm a terrorist. I mean, I, so the, the, the story that has uh, undoubtedly captured the heart of Twitter uh, all the way up to the president uh, and a number of others is a 14-year-old kid makes a clock. Uh, on a circuit circuit board, brings it into school. Teacher calls it in as a bomb threat. Kid gets arrested, and um, the internet erupts. It's so ridiculous. I, I mean, I don't know. You can yeah. you can take the racial profiling thing. No, I think to that's a whole nuts. New level, right. I mean, that's like, what, did the the background nationality of the person did that matter? Like, if someone else brought in a clock, would they? You know, what I mean? but then you can just talk about the. Uh, skill level of the teacher, like, dude, he brought in a clock and showed you, and like, you don't know the difference between a clock and a bomb. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, was, this, was he? Show, I don't know the background. Like, was he showing it to the teacher? Well, yeah, I mean, was bombs, it the teacher teaching him electronics? And should I've that teacher enough, know? I've watched enough TV, so I know that a bomb has to have either C4 or Semtex. Yeah, has to have a, a clearly labeled blasting cap in it. It must have a red wire, a green wire, a blue wire, and a yellow wire. You always Sometimes cut the black red, wire. Cut the red yeah. wire first. Unless unless you're supposed to cut the blue one first. Right. And it's tough to tell because sometimes they cross them and that's, you can't really tell. Yeah, that's the right. wires have to be perfectly wound. No, I mean, look, I you know, I looked at this and at one hand, uh, that's kind of like the snark that kind of has like, how do you not know? But if I flip it around and I've got a ton, ton of other stuff, you know, and, and I don't know what's happening in that school environment. If you've got Zero, I'm not a fan of these zero tolerance policies, but but if you have a zero tolerance policy, somebody brings in something, you don't know what it is. You know that there's been a problem with bullies at your school, and you don't want to be the one that didn't do something, and then this kid blows up a bunch of other kids. Um, I, I get it. Is it national news? I don't know. Did he need to be arrested? I mean, like I think there could have been a stop in there somewhere where somebody said, dude, it's, it's a clock. There, right. there should have been somebody in that school. Or at least I would think there was somebody in that chain – that could have said it looks like a clock to to me. He said right. it's a clock. It looks like a clock, you know. I mean, but to, to arrest him to and then and then everybody goes crazy on it, right? Was right. it racial profiling? Was it stupidity? Would it? Ooh, I, I'll tell you what. I, twenty years ago, no, I'm going older. All right, forget it. Longer than twenty years ago, when I was in high school, uh, we we had to deal with all sorts of things um, that that. Pe- 
people I thought was incredulous that we had to deal with as a school in, in terms of drug education and handling all sorts of things that, frankly, I thought parents should handle. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at what teachers have to do now, and, and I, I don't know how they do it. I have a lot of respect for teachers because they have to be teachers, they have to be parents, they have to be disciplinarians, but they're very, they're very narrowly constricted on what they can and can't do. So, I, you know, I, I think we rush to judgment on all sides of this. Uh, you know, more no, I think you're right, and I think your point is, is valid, Mike, as the teacher, if you express valid concern today. Um, you know, we're not looking at it from their perspective. However, I look at it from a security perspective, since this is a security podcast, and I say I, our security <laughs> has to get a little better than arresting a kid for this. No, like, that, there's got to be a better way. And that goes back to your point too, Mike. That feels like a very, like, I mean, we, we all jumped right on, well, I didn't, I actually stayed out of it, but, but I watched people jump on the teacher. I watched them jump on the principal. I watched them jump on the cops. I watched them jump on the city. I, the city, my goodness gracious. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's awesome the kid is. At 14 years old, built a class. I mean, I think it's great, and I think that we should celebrate that, and that's, that's really cool. Bringing that the, into the school. The kid, I, and we don't have his name. We keep, we, keep saying, we keep saying the kid. We don't, I don't have his name in front of me, but um, the, there was an interview that he did with the press, actually, and he said he wants to go to MIT and stuff like that. So I uh, think that's, that's really that's encouraging. Sucks. George Takai wrote a, a really nice thing on Facebook, too. Um, having been the victim of some racial profiling and, and kind of reached out to him and gave him words of encouragement too. So uh, there's been a lot of positive that came out of this. I feel bad the kid had to get arrested and all that stuff. And again, that's where I feel the security I, has failed us uh, in this particular instance. I completely agree with that. I just, I, I would, I'm always careful uh, when we jump right to racial profiling, unless somebody said, unless somebody was very explicit with mm-hmm. their language that, that indicated that's what this was. To me, it almost feels like, I mean, schools are such a hotbed of concern these days, and with cyberbullying and all these things that we didn't have to contend with. Right. Look, if you were in school, when you and I were in school, if you had a problem with somebody, there was the whole, I'll meet you after school, or I'll take the bus home and kick your ass in your mother's parking lot type of thing. And, and uh, you know, and and it was it was a problem. But, you know, you talk to administrators now who were administrators then, and they said, you know what, there was enough going around the school, you had time to deal with it. Mm. Today, you, you don't. So, jumpy, yeah. Um, really odd outcome? Absolutely. Right. Anything beyond that? No. Um, so I, I don't have a segue to WordPress. Sorry, I, man. I a, yeah, you know what? WordPress is WordPress. Let, I, can, we just, can we not talk about... Anyway. Yeah, um, let's do Bruce Schneier asked a great question. He makes a lot of assumptions, I think, too. Um, but basically he says, with the hacking team breach, right? If someone can breach hacking team, then the NSA could probably breach hacking team. And if the NSA breached hacking team, he says they likely did. So let's just say that the assumption is that NSA was in hacking team. They knew that um, hacking team had the zero days and likely could have stolen those zero days. So okay. the question he kind of poses is if, if NSA has the zero day, how come they don't report it and fix it and what do they do with it? I think the answer is kind of obvious is yeah, but that's, I mean, look, if we flip it around, all right, so so I think it's an interesting leap, right? It, it, it's, a, it's a logical chain. Somebody who's really into this type of stuff will point out any of the fallacies in it. But let's go ahead and say, all right, holds, I'm good with it. NSA's job isn't to do that. That's not, they're, they're, they're not the clearinghouse for this. They're not DHS. Their job is to go look at ways to improve intelligence. So if, if hacking team had this and they were selling it to people and people were using it, but they knew it, they fingerprinted it, and it gave them access to information and resources that they wouldn't have gotten to otherwise, mm. why would they disclose that? Right. I'm not saying I condone it, by the way. Right. I'm just looking at the logic of the, it. The logic of why they did it. that's uh, not yeah. their charter. Their charter isn't to protect the, it, it, the world. We talked about this Team last America, week. Good movie, but not their, not their thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That probably comes up through Google searches, I'm guessing. (laughs) So, not just Team America. Um, But we talked about it last week where, you know, is is it doing more harm than good? If we leave these vulnerabilities out there and we know that certain people know them and we don't tell the people who have the vulnerabilities, we're doing a disservice. And it comes back to that question. I don't think we're going to get to the bottom. I don't think there is a good answer to that as to whether we tell people about a zero-day vulnerability and exploit or whether we quietly fix it, even if that takes a year or longer, and leave those people ignorant and blissful for an entire year or longer. I think there's another question to it, too. Who's making that call? Right. I mean, if, if you're in a huge, somewhat siloed organization and you discover it, are, are you allowed to keep that to yourself? How far up the flagpole, the proverbial flagpole, does that fly? Mm-hmm. And, and how far should it fly? And then, of course, that gets us all into our questions that, that you know I keep bringing up. Okay, well, what's that council look like? How fast should they act? 
what's appropriate? How do we classify that stuff? I, I don't know. I think they're good questions. I think they're, they're valid questions. I think it's worth paying attention so, to. Apparently, there's a lot of dislike button scams for Facebook going on around there. <laughs> do you use Facebook, Mike? Um, reluctantly, I do. Yeah. So I think we're friends, aren't we friends? I, I probably. Would yeah, you be do. my friend if you're not my friend? Would you be it's, my friend? It's a lo- you're, you're my friend in real life, so <laughs> we don't need to be friends on Facebook. But if you put up cat pictures, I'll like you, and yeah. you'll feel better. <laughs> I do I not put up cat pictures on Facebook. Um, but so you know, there's this whole thing when they came out with the like button. They're like, why isn't there a dislike button? And Facebook for years has always said no, there isn't. But apparently, there's a lot of scams of people saying, hey, you know, install the dislike button or whatever. But now Facebook really is threatening to come out with a dislike button, although it's not really a dislike button. So now there's more scams of people talking about the dislike button. But the, really what they're coming out with is, and I don't know if you've seen this about Facebook, this is very little to do with security other than there's dislike button scams out there, which really is not news to people. Um, but the, the real reason is because you ever see a, a Facebook post where someone's like, you know, my, my pet just died or my family member just died, and then you always get those people that like, like that. And you're like, but I'm not really liking the fact that you just lost someone. I'm just right. I'm liking it because I'm giving I'm you too, a thumbs up. Right? I'm, I'm too it's, lazy. It's the head bob. Yeah, yeah, I'm too lazy to comment, but I want to do something to acknowledge that I saw your post. So I'm gonna like it, even though you know your dog is sick or something. So, so they need the head nod button. But yeah, you know, so, but that's I what think... Facebook is coming out with some type of well sympathy. I don't know if it's gonna. I don't. I don't know what's gonna be. I think there be, is but. a potential security angle here, which is they're gonna get. Look, if, flip it around. If you're Facebook and what you have right now is a like, all right, and and you've done more looking at the Facebook algorithms than I have, but Facebook is pr- is pretty good at the algorithms, and I I can tell that they're decent at it, but not quite dialed in yet because I see people bitch all the time. No, I don't want the top stories. Damn it, I want what I want. Give me what I right. Yeah, so Facebook gives you what you think, what they think you want. What they think you want. Uh, well, so how do you fine tune that? Well, what do we see with every other social network today, right? I, I can I can vote up or vote down. I like right. this. I don't like this. I want to see more that's like this. The, I don't want to see more the like Reddit, this. That's the Reddit. They don't model. have a way to say, don't show me crap like this. Now, that's not true. They do. You can go into specific posts and hide them and say, don't show me posts like this. Mm-hmm. But that's hard as compared to click a little button. Right. So, so where does the security thing come in? Well, if they're going to start to fine tune these profiles even greater, does that increase – what they can sell to marketers, yes. So therefore, does it increase what they can figure out about you and and the information they have on you in those profiles? Does that become more interesting to attackers? I of wonder. If, it does. Yeah. Well, I wonder if it increases the likelihood that someone's going to abuse it and figure out how to get their stuff in other people's feeds without paying for it, kind of thing, too. Oh, I'm sure that'll happen. You know, I mean, it's they, inevitable well, that it happens. Facebook figures it out, and then they can't do that anymore. It's a cat and mouse game, just like every other social network out there. I've recently, and I know we've had some folks on talking about it, but I've recently started to learn about um, the OSINT uh, stuff a lot, and it's, uh, let's just say it's eye-opening to me. So any mm-hmm. any time a social network that has this much reach and this much volume and, and can profile people so quickly, basically based on who your friends are and what you like, they'll tell you all about you in like 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. So... They're already aggregating a ton of data. I, I think it's interesting. I, I, I think it's worth paying attention to at least. Um, we got a lot of other stuff on there too. Um, talked about the Microsoft thing. Uh, where do you want to go from here? Um, bringing hey, the sand still. I was. Uh, yeah, that to. one was kind of interesting to me. Yeah, the I need to have a lot of details there. Um, other than Cesar Cerudo, I'm, I'm saying his name right, he's a researcher for IOAC. He's done a lot of uh, IoT device and a lot of security research over the years. Um, and it's interesting, the first question, they're like, so <clears throat> you can take down an entire city. And his first answer is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, let's put this in perspective. First of all, I want to make it clear that it was in a lab. It wasn't an actual city. Right. It was the same devices. I didn't actually, you know, take down or hack into a an actual city because that is illegal and I would be put in jail. So he has to actually set the stage for that first. Um, and then he talks. And I've heard these stories for years, Mike, from people, you know, in security about how traffic lights and all these other things can be hacked. And as we've talked about, Devices. These are devices just like any other device. And now, when they get internet connected, well, of course, you can hack them. So, um. so let's point out something that I really like about this because we, we, we obviously, I, I take a, a, I'm sometimes the different voice looking at how we conduct the research. By the way, I think one of the things I've figured out in the last couple of weeks is that what I'm curious then is that what are and I, I brought it up last week again, but. 
you know, what, what are the things that govern research? What, what should we expect from it? Call it whatever you want, um, but there should be some sort of a guidelines or socially acceptable way to do it. Here's what I think is fascinating in, in this article. It basically, the, the person interviewing says, so you, you traveled and you hacked the city's traffic system and you've done it in Manhattan. And um, Caesar says, uh, no, no, stop. No, I didn't. That's, that's illegal. I didn't do that. I had the same gear in a lab. I tested it in a lab. And then I passively watched the traffic to suggest it could do the same thing. I love that answer. I like mm-hmm. the fact he came right out. He didn't. There was no stunt hacking. He right, didn't. Right. He didn't gridlock DC. He didn't prove his point. He didn't rave. He said, "Look, I went into a lab. I figured these things out. I came out. I captured this traffic. It looks to me like it could be done, but I'm not the guy. I didn't do it. I'm just saying it could be done. We're paying attention to it. I, I think it's an interesting way to look at stuff. So, I think that that's. I think it's pretty good." Um, I think it goes back to the things that we keep talking about. We, we are moving very aggressively. We want to be connected. We want to be low cost. We want to have more services. And, and we want to do it very fast. We, um, back when I lived in New Jersey, we, we, the city that I was part of, I was on a tech council for them. And we got a grant to do wireless to connect the, the town hall to the school. And I can remember, you know, and I was a security guy and I was asking all sorts of questions. What protocol are you going to use? How are you going to, you know, protect it? And this is, this is going back some time there too. And to be fair, I never really tested it. So I, I couldn't tell you how they did or didn't do. What I can tell you is at least somebody thought through and answered those questions. And they had answers to those questions and they had a written plan for it. And I think is, what we're is finding. This a city? Is this a city? It was a city. Okay. It was a city. It was a city, but so they got what I've noticed in what I've noticed in cities is the parking meters now. The parking meters have uh, it's a credit card machine. Myrtle Beach has that. Yeah, so I I was parking at the hospital, and I'm like, like where's the? There's no meter, and then there's a sign that says, "Oh, you got to go use this machine over there." And you go to the machine, and this one only took credit cards. Put your credit card in. I want this much time. Spits out a little receipt, and you put that in your windshield. Yep. And I'm kind of thinking, like, wow, we uh, we've got an issue here because this is a credit card machine. And what's the difference between this machine and say an ATM machine, right. Or a gas pump, right? The big difference for me is likely there's no surveillance camera, right? The ATM, all the ATMs have a camera, right? And you have to learn how to subvert that or cover your face if you're going to install a skimmer or something. Gas stations too, right? I mean, cameras, most likely at most gas stations. At some city street, man, there there probably isn't a camera. Yeah, that's a the parking garages, a, they tend to be better set, but you're right, the streets. Parking I garages, mean, but this is like... No, street, I know, yeah. no, I, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing we're starting to see too, and this isn't, uh, and I see some more cities is, oh, uh, by the way, uh, if you don't have a credit card handy, uh, you can just pay using your cell phone and you can set up an account and here, you know, um, scan this QR code. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. So how easy is it to just paste over that QR code? Mm-hmm. Or now, wait, hold on. Now we've just welcomed them into the world of mobile apps. Okay, well, did they go through a security check? Who, who did they contract with? And, and I'm not knocking low-cost providers, but, you know, like, it, did they just do it based on, on budget or did they do it based on knowledge? And, and did the person have knowledge of that type of app? Did they have knowledge of that type of coding? I mean, goodness gracious. So, no, I mean, it's, it's, we're, we're absolutely at an interesting time. And, and so I think cities like this, or cities, I think stories like this are great because I, I like it. Look, I, I like being able to go look up what's happening in a city. I like to be able to do those things. And frankly, you know, I, I'm not yet comfortable with using my, my uh, cell phone in order to pay for the parking, but I'm not fully against it. I mean, I certainly like yeah, to keep it. Yeah, because it's certainly better than digging through your car for change. Yeah, I did that the other day, actually. <laughs> yes, isn't that I, awful? Like, I, I actually, I had a roll of quarters in the car just yeah, for that purpose, yeah. and I don't have a roll of quarters anymore. Yeah, and then you get and you're like, I got two quarters. Crap, is that going to be enough time? You go through that whole that whole thing, right? Um, before we conclude this episode, I want to mention InfoSecEvents.net. Uh, they post a weekly summary of the security news, and there's a lot more stories in there that we didn't get a chance to talk uh, talk about. This week was particularly interesting. And um, they always do a great job at InfoSec events, but they, uh, this week there was a lot of interesting stories to talk about. And they break it down of like events-related tools, techniques, uh, vendor software patches, vulnerabilities, other news. And they're pretty thorough about talking about what's 
you know, you're going to see Dave Kennedy talking about on uh, on Fox News, right? All the way down to this dude that has a blog that's made like five posts, made this sixth post, and released this new tool that lets you do something cool. Um, and that's what I really like about uh, InfoSec events is they, they run the gamut. So there's a lot of cool stuff uh, at InfoSecEvents.net. They post a weekly summary. And I wanted to give them a shout-out because I, we use them uh, to get stories for the show. So I want to make sure people have that resource. Yeah, it's awesome. I, it's, I put it in my rotation. Yeah, it's a, it's a great read. Um, and they also categorize all the events. If you want to know the information security events going around uh, across the globe, it's a great site for that as well. So good job, guys. Uh, that's all we have time for tonight, Mike. But uh, thank you for uh, for hosting tonight with me. It's been a time flies fun. when you're having a good time. I know we had a, we had a lot of good laughs. We talked. We hit the major points. Talked about WordPress <laughs> a little, I guess. Uh, a little bit. Oh, awesome! Well, thanks everyone for watching. We'll see everyone next week. Over and out. <laughs>